It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody. Starring the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein and the revolutionary Robert Begley. I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are indubitably Robert Begley. How are you doing today, Robert? Oh, I'm doing great, Andy. Happy to cover a new hero in my life who I only heard about a couple of weeks ago. But I want to thank you for kind of uh, bringing him to my mind. Uh, somebody who's had his life and certainly his ending is like nobody else that we've covered. And absolutely right. We're talking, of course, about Raoul Wallenberg, the Swedish mm -hmm. businessman, diplomat, yes. uh, probably OSS agent during during World War II. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows for sure when he died. We know he died in, right. in, the, Soviet, in Soviet prison. 1947 is often given as a date. But yeah, there's a lot of controversy. A little bit about yeah, him. born in 1912 uh, in Sweden, right? His well, yes, wealthy fa wealthy family. The, well, I I know I know eventually he went to the University of Michigan. I remember I remember that and studied yes. architecture. But what was his childhood yeah. like, Rob? Do you know much about? So his childhood, childhood, yeah, yeah. First of all, it's a it's a family dynasty from Sweden that they they had industrialists, they had banking uh, concerns, and three months before he's born, his father died of cancer. That's and then about. after he's three months old, his maternal grandfather dies and uh, of pneumonia. So it's, it's his mother and his grandmother are primarily raising him until he, he becomes school age. And I think then it's his paternal grandfather who has a big impact on him. And he's after high school, he goes into mandatory military, I think for six months in Sweden. And then he studies in Paris. I mean, this guy went all over the world. And then architecture was what he wanted to do. He wanted to be a builder. So here we are, Andy, early 20th century <laughs> architect uh, comes to America. But he loves America. He loves the pace, the fast pace of America, the, the ambitious people. And the way he gets around, he travels all over the country and even in Canada, he hitchhikes. And he writes to his grandfather saying, you know, this is a way... Hitchhike is, is about diplomacy and sizing up people quickly and, you know, negotiating and finding weaknesses and strengths and uh, building a rapport. So all of these things would help him, it certainly right. would help him later in life. Yeah, something struck me about Wallenberg's life is he was a, he's a rich kid. But he was yeah. he wasn't this this prima donna you know look down your nose snooty kind of kind of you know no. uh, stereotype rich kid he uh, he worked at the at the World's Fair or whatever it was in Chicago pulling rickshaws you know rickshaws with the other, yeah yeah with the other uh -huh. kids and that's you know that, that's a lot of manual work you put so, you know pulling people in a you know in a in a <clears> rickshaw <throat> it shows us he was not afraid to work manually do hard physical labor because pulling rickshaws is all day in in, in yeah. a, at a fair is not is not my idea of fun you know and hitchhiking all over all over the all over the country uh, uh you know it's you know it's adventure it's an adventurous spirit and he, you're, you're right he, he loved the united states and it's interesting mm -hmm. that he went to the university of michigan so he yep. graduates 1935 goes back to sweden and then he's told your architect your degree doesn't count here you, you can't build here. So then his uh, grandfather sets him up to go to uh, South Africa, Cape Town, where he does some business there. Then he goes to Haifa, which is in Palestine, uh, now mm -hmm. uh, Israel. And he's doing some banking there, working for a Dutch bank. And then uh, 1936, uh, back in Sweden, and he starts a business and it fails. So... Um, a couple of years later, he uh, partners an import-export business, and here's the, here's the pivotal uh, pivotal point in his life. Uh, this man named Kalmer Lauer, who was a Hungarian Jew, and um, this is 1938. The, the The Nazis are taking over Europe, and Hungary is one of the last, you know, one 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 of the places where they want they 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 occupy it. They install the same kinds of uh, disgusting tactics, uh, rounding up the Jews. Uh, they are making them wear yellow stars. And uh, Karl Malauer can't go. He's, he, he can't go back. He's afraid for his life. So Wallenberg mm -hmm. is the one who goes, who goes there regularly. And, uh, you know, he sees these things, but it's not enough, you know, to make him uh completely changed his life uh so then he's in sweden 
and uh, he sees a movie. Andy, what uh, what he tells about the yeah. movie? Yeah. Oh, this is oh, this is this is a great story, Robert. Robert, thank you. I, I I'm ho hopeful that uh, let's go back to the beginning. I'm hopeful that yeah. our audience knows Baroness Auxie's great novel, The Scarlet Pimpin. And if yes. you if you don't, everybody, you read for a treat. I envy you. Absolutely. You'll get a yeah. get a copy from Amazon or from the local library. And read the Scarlet mm -hmm. Pimpernel because it's it's a great novel. It's a, certainly a, a, a heroic story. So 1930s Leslie Howard, the the, the famous British actor, who many people know as, as Ashley Wilkes from Gone with the Wind. Not the most heroic role, but he played the Scarlet no. Pimpernel brilliantly and beautifully yes. during the 1930s. Great movie, strongly recommend. But Leslie Howe is perfect as the Scarlet Pimpernel. And yes. then when World War II breaks out, the British pick a great propaganda anti-Nazi movie titled Pimpernel Smith with uh, mm -hmm. Leslie Howard as the quiet kind of you know kind of bumbling this is this is the act he puts on this kind of bumbling you know archaeology professor long buffoon. before indiana jones mm -hmm. yeah buffoon is yeah. Buffoon. <laughs> long before indiana jones but uh you know it, uh, um he he rescues dissidents and and jews from from the nazis he rescues like 28 people i think while, while he's yeah while he's in germany mm -hmm. ostensibly searching for evidence of an aryan civilization in germany which he tells the nazis at the end there's no aryan civilization in germany. right and so, it's just the movie's a movie it, it, amongst other things uh, you know amongst the tremendous heroism of, of his escapades rescuing dissidents and you know and jews and other prisoners from, from germany so pimpernel smith you know he's a big hero smuggling smuggling jews and other you know uh, enemies of the state out of out of Germany and, yeah. and um it's banned in Sweden which is neutral but uh Wallenberg and his sister see it at a special showing at the British Embassy in Stockholm and mm -hmm. his sister said later that after the movie Wallenberg was so impressed with it he told her I want to do something like that you know there's a hero's yeah. reaction to uh, you know yes. to, to see it it reminded me yeah. reminded me when I when I read about that that his sister's said that that's what that was Wallenberg's response that uh, Oscar Wilde's famous line that life imitates art right well mm -hmm. uh, here's a mm -hmm. you know here's an here's an example of it so he's inspired by that so if we just set the context here you mentioned briefly that Sweden was neutral in in this war you know all these atrocities are happening and they are not taking a stand this helped Wallenberg because they were interested, they had business interests. And here's where like pragmatism in war uh, can, is, we know how bad it is. And in this sense, it's, it's a mixed, it's a mixed bag, but Wallenberg took advantage of this because he studied dip diplomacy and he s learned the ins and outs from his trips back and forth to, uh, to Hungary, to Budapest, he saw the way things operated and, and the Germans were very efficient and they wanted to see records of everything. And uh, this helped him to, to kind of manipulate uh, the system here. So what's happening in Germany, March, 1944, the war for all practical, the, the momentum of the war, especially uh, with America, uh, becoming more and more uh, aggressive and assertive in the war, it's not going to end pretty for the Germans. Well, so what do they do? They do what despicable, disgusting uh, people, so much of this, Andy, uh, Eichmann, uh, Adolf Eichmann, his idea just for me is out of Atlas Shrugged. All he wants to do is deal with the Jewish problem, the Jewish question, exterminate as many as possible. He's got 12,000 of them every day going from Hungary on trains to <clears throat> Auschwitz. And uh, so when, when Wallenberg comes, he's, he has to figure out a way how to stop this and eventually comes up with right. this idea of having passports. Um, what, any a Swedish passport that basically says this Jewish person, even though they have a yellow star on their clothing, they're effectively a Swedish citizen and you Nazis can't touch them. Okay. And he right. finds like 12, 12 to like 20 different buildings where he's yeah. considering, um, he has all these uh, Jews coming into these buildings 
and giving them jobs, having them work uh, somewhat for, you know, for their freedom. Schultz Pass, I think, was the name of the uh, the passport. And because the Germans are so efficient, they see a document that's printed and neat, and, and they, you know, they were like, okay, yeah, that's that's good. You know, that's, that's, that's definitely good. Just a little bit of the backstory of how he got involved. Because Sweden couldn't, they couldn't help in this effort. They knew what he wanted to do, but because they were neutral in the war, they didn't. And that was where American bank, you know, uh, American financial backing came in handy as one, one of the ways to get right. Wallenberg involved. And uh, so as he's, his architectural skills even came in handy, uh, Andy, because he's got all these buildings and there's up to like 35,000 Jews that he could fit in places that normally fit like 5,000. He's he's just rearranging things with this you know architectural mind to make them uh, survive in these places. Now, I think it's up to like four hundred thirty-five thousand Jews were already Hungarian. I should say Hungarian Jews from Hungary. Right. Uh, and now the other villain in this story in this saga is the Arrow Cross, which are Hungarians and they're largely young punks who just want to beat up Jews and and and. Um, uh, yeah, the Hungarian, Hungarian fascists, right? Yeah, Hungarian fascists. And Andy, I, I have to say one, you know, one of the saddest things uh, about this, but sometimes we need imagery here. So they would tie up men, women, and children, uh, three at a time, put them right near the Danube uh, River, the Blue Danube River. And they would all, of the three, so say there's like a hundred of them, but only in three, so 99 of them, they would shoot the person in the middle, okay? And this is in this is in the winter now of 1944. And so the person in the middle would go down into the water, into some freezing cold water, and the two on each side of them would, you know, effectively be frozen to death and drown. And just to save bullets, and they renamed, it wasn't the Blue Danube, they called it the Red Danube, with all, all the right. blood that it came. You know, like sometimes we need this imagery to see how vicious yeah. th this mindset yeah. is. And Wallenberg sees this, and, and he has to act faster. And he sees trains that are loaded, ready to go, you know, take, take away more, thousands more Jews. And he'll see a train, Andy, and he'll jump on top of it on the roof. And he's like, right. no, these people are these people. He, I have passports for all all of these people, and the Arrow Cross. They're young punks, and they're like shooting around him. They're not shooting at him because they don't. They don't. They see a man with moral certitude. They don't have that in themselves, you know. They're and so that's one reason his moral character stood, you know, so everyone can witness this. And he just he did not, you know, he didn't back down. And then they would eventually get the Jews off these trains. I mean, this is how he just saved countless Jews over and over again. And um, another tactic the that he used, Andy. You know, the, 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 courage. The, the, the courage. Yeah. The courage yeah. of, yeah. The, of, so, of the hero. So he, he and Eichmann were butting heads. And Eichmann actually had some kind of a respect for, for uh, Wallenberg. Maybe he had like a shred of decent, one one sliver of decency in his whole psyche. So we, we, should, we should point out, Rob, Eichmann, Eichmann, of course, later uh, kidnapped by the, kidnapped's not the right, right word, but they, they illegally abducted him from Argentina in like 1960, brought him mm. to Israel, tried mm -hmm. him, convicted mm -hmm. him, uh, and hanged. Yeah. So Eichmann was eventually hanged for his, for his crimes by the Israelis. Pro yeah, pro properly so. But, yes. what, but what I can the remember that. I was very young. I was very young, 1961, 1962. Wow. The Israelis okay. gave the Israelis, I remember, no, it was a big, it was big world news. Uh, the Israelis Should gave him a fair yeah. trial. Yeah, the, the Israelis gave yeah. him a fair trial. You know, they he had a defense. Well, that's attorney, the difference. You know, yeah, they, that's, uh, yeah, that's the difference between civilized society and a, and a barbaric one, which, which right. the, the one Eichmann grew up in and, and perpetuated was clearly barbaric. So he wants to have, a, he, he sees all the good, all the things Wallenberg is doing and he wants him killed. So he gets, a, you know, a German Jeep uh, to run into uh, to Wallenberg's car and he crashes into it. And Eichmann's waiting by the phone, phone rings and it's Wallenberg saying, you, <laughs> you missed this time, you know, I'm still alive. And, and I, oh, wow. he's like, my, wow. my driver, there was someone else in the car. It wasn't me basically. And so he's, this little cat and mouse game, 
that, uh, but even Eichmann, so one of the other things Wallenberg would do is because the war is winding down, he's basically saying, look, you, if you don't let me allow these Jews to go to, to be referred to as, uh, you know, Swedish citizens and you leave them alone, don't put them on these trains, you will be forgiven when it comes to war crimes. But if you don't, you will be hanged. You know, there will be a war. This war is lost for you guys. Yeah. So you, right, to right. say, like you just said, Andy, he's appealing to their self-interest. Because if yeah. you really want to live right. in six, seven months after the, the, the Allies have won this war, and then it comes to trials, uh, do the right thing. And some of them did. You know, to their credit, I mean, Eichmann was on. Uh, he was he he went down. You know, uh, he was not convincible, but uh, several of the others. And here's where Wallenberg's negotiating, you know, uh, po policies came in. And he studied acting, and he would, be, you know, he would exaggerate things, and just just to make his point, anything he could do. That was what he would do to, you know, to save the lives of of these people. Yeah, so, and bribed, you know, and he bribed, he, he bribed, you know, yes. German and Arrow Cross officials. You're right; they had, had American money, right? Uh, he, yeah. he, any, anything, yeah. it, anything it took to, you know, to right. be able to, you know, save the lives of of the of these Jews that he was defending. Yeah, yeah, and so now we get to December 1944. Okay, so it's it, it, he's succeeding. But the Red Army is now coming in from, uh, we knew Germany would lose, so the Red Army is coming in from the east, and the Germans, the Nazis are ready to, they're ready to flee. And sure enough, you know, they, they effectively capture Wallenberg, uh, who is volunteer, he doesn't know his fate. In fact, I think they, um, one of the commanders, uh, Malinovsky, is calls for Wallenberg and his driver brings him to the, you know, to the place to meet. And he, the last thing he says is, I don't know whether I'm going, you know, whether I, I'm, I'm going to be a guest or a prisoner, you know, when they right. get me. Right. And that's it. That's uh, right. January. Was that, uh, I think, right. January 17th, uh, 1945. Yeah, January 17th, 1945. Correct. Which is now Wallenberg Day in several places, you know, around the world. They they consider that because that was the last day he was seen alive. Last day of, of Wallenberg's freedom, right? Yeah, and, of, uh, certainly of his freedom. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and he's deported to Russia. You know, to the the yep. the Lubyanka prison in Moscow is a notorious yeah. place because KGB headquarters is there. The KGB torture chambers are there. And yeah. Wallenberg spent the last, we don't know how many years, because it's, this right. is controversial, right? It's debated. Yeah. But mm -hmm. he spent the last years of his life in the KGB prison. And uh, the Soviets eventually, ex executed is not the right word, since, since Wallenberg was innocent man, they murdered him. They murdered uh, you know, yeah. an, an innocent man. Mm -hmm. And if he, uh, if he was kidnapped by the Soviets, because of his ties to the OSS, you know, to American, uh, the, the forerunner of the CIA. Well, in January 1945, the USSR and the, the USA were still allies against Nazi Germany. Why, yes. why, why do you kidnap an espionage agent who's working against the Nazis for one of your allies? But, yeah. uh, you know, so we, could, we could speculate here, Robert. I mean, Stalin is in power in the Soviet Union. He's paranoid. He's, a, what, he's, as, he's as, as, at least as vicious a murderer as Hitler was, yep. with as, with as mm -hmm. much blood on his hands, maybe more, you know, innocent people than, than on, on Hitler's. Yes. You mm -hmm. imagine, imagine putting that on your epitaph. Yeah, I murdered more, I murdered more innocent people than Hitler. Oh, yeah. You know, but, yeah. but, you know, if you're a freedom fighter, uh, even if it's against your enemies, Nazi Germany, you're a freedom fighter. You know, you're dangerous. So, yeah, that could yes. certainly be why why the Soviets abducted and eventually murdered Wallenberg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one other uh, possible theory that I read of was, okay, they're communists, the Red Army, they're communists. What is the polar opposite of communism? What ec socioeconomic system is polar opposite of communism? It's not the fascists, because they're the same side of a di uh, uh, different side of the same coin. No, it's the capitalists. Mm -hmm. And they just assume right. because Wallenberg was wealthy, uh, you know, from a, a family of wealth, he was a capitalist and he was somewhat in cahoots 
because he had some business arrangements with the Germans and therefore just, you know, your capitalism, you, you must die. You're, you're a capitalist and therefore you must die. So that's, came, you know, I came across came that a, as well. Yeah. Came from a wealthy family, Swedish industrialists, right? So he was right. businessman. That's right. So, uh, That's yeah. right. Well, the Soviets, the Soviets, like the Nazis, you know, the communists as well as the National Socialists don't need much of an excuse uh, right. to kill you. They, yeah. they, they, mm -hmm. they, they don't need a re to kill you. I, I don't even remember where I, was this in Pimpinel Smith. It was in some movie I saw recently where somebody s said about these bad guys. That, actually, I think it was a different movie. <laughs> I've seen too many that get it all mm -hmm. like, jumbled together in my head. But it was a great line, and certainly applies to the communists and the National Socialists both. What, what this person said: these people don't need a reason to kill you; they need a reason not to kill you. As yeah. oh, Oh, that's profound, you know, about yes. about evil, this kind of evil yeah. monsters who murdered millions of innocent human beings, whether they're fighting class mm -hmm. war in the communist case or race war in the national socialist case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, 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 so you know, Wallenberg is a freedom fighter. He's a he's an industrialist, a wealthy businessman. He probably has ties to U.S. intelligence, you know, to America. That is enough. That, that, that's yeah. a, that's a, that's enough of a reason mm -hmm. for the communists to murder him. Yeah. So there's also a documentary, Andy, because the, the number of, of Hungarian Jews who he say varies, the numbers vary from, you know, a couple of thousand to tens of thousands to hundred thousand. It's, it's hard to know that without him kind of verifying that. But um, so it's af after his disappearance, the world is not really like looking f for him. Like there were just things that come out decades later about him. But in America, there's one uh, member of the House of Representatives, Tom Lantos in the 1980s, and he was rescued as a boy uh, by Wallenberg. And he wanted to write that ship. He was like, this man needs to be recognized. And so Reagan, he appeals to uh, Reagan, who's president at the time, and Wallenberg becomes the second honorary American citizen. So guess what, Andy? We've covered <laughs> now two honorary American citizens because Winston Churchill <laughs> was the first one. <clears throat> and at that ceremony, Reagan says, wherever he is, his humanity burns like a torch. You know, just talking about Wallenberg and just his idea of him. So they, then there are statues for him uh, in, in London, in Tel Aviv. Uh, there's plaques for him. So his so his, the memory of his achievement is kept up. Again, this man should be a household name. You know, the fact that I'm a hero worshiper too, Andy, and I never heard of him until, you know, a couple of weeks ago, you brought, you, you insisted, you didn't bring him, you didn't even suggest, you were like insisting, we got to cover this guy. So thank you. Oh yeah, well, yeah. Oh yeah, you're welcome. We got to do Wallenberg. Yeah, he's, he's the, the courage, yeah. you know, is, yes. is, is the salient, you know, you know, distinguishing characteristic of a hero, you, whether, whether, the, whether yes. they stand it up for your life or for the lives of innocent people, or you're protecting some yeah. value that's dear to you, that's, you know, that's under, under attack. You know, and uh, mm -hmm. you, you you gave the perfect example. He's up on the train, you know, filled with Jews, handed yeah. out passports while the Hungarian yeah. fascists are blasted, you know, are blasted away. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I mean, this, yeah, this is a, a real hero. His life was in danger every second. He had the 30 buildings that, that he bought or rented. Mm -hmm. he's, he's shoehorning all these Jews in there. Eichmann's boys could have come after him at any time. Uh, and so and they yeah, did. His life, they his, did. You know, they yeah, eventually did. Right, right. Uh, trying to right. hit his car. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So he survived the Nazis, but didn't survive the communists. And, but his life was in danger. Uh, you yeah. know, e every day that he was in Hungary, engaging in, in his his freedom fighting activities, and he didn't have to do this. First of all, he he wasn't a Jew. He was a you know, he. Well, even if he was a Jew, he didn't have to. He was safe in Sweden. You know, he didn't have to yes. go risk his life. For That's you know, right. for innocent human beings mm -hmm. that he has no, he, he he didn't know, you know, these, these aren't his family members or or anything, but his sense of humanity, his sense of of right and wrong, you know, moral rectitude, that this is just an That's atrocity, right. and we as as human beings, we you know, we have yeah. to do everything we can to to put an end to this. This is the this is the real moral rectitude of a, a, and courage of of a hero. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
yeah, I, I couldn't couldn't add anything else, Andy. I, I just think everything you said captures this man who, again, in a short period, it's June 1944 that he comes on the map. In December 1944 is, uh, or January 16th is the last time he takes an act as a free man because January 17th is the last that he's seen. But just in that short, you know, six month span, the, the, the guy did a lot. You know, just save, saving lives uh, that people remember him, you know, ancestors, uh, you know, to this day, remember what he did and his, his humanity. I mean, you know, we, we toss around this word humanitarian, Andy. The, the word is just bastardized yeah. these days. Yeah, but well, if it, gets applied, if it gets applied to Ellsworth Tui, then it has, yes. no, it has yes. no rational meaning. But yeah, but it does yeah. apply lit uh, legitimately to, to Wallenberg. Yeah. Yeah. And also businessman. I think it's important, the business side of him, because this is where he learned uh, how to deal with people, how to get things done and how, how to reroute, you know, find backup plans when things are not working. So the business aspect, I think, was really important. So, uh, you know, we always hear how evil businessmen are how <laughs> in practically every movie and every uh you know, novel, modern novel that comes out. But here's a businessman who used his skills, turned it into a di di diplomacy, certainly could have been, you know, a spy, an American spy, uh, or just, you know, under, under Ameri certainly under American financing. But all the good that he did in this short period of time, I, I just, uh, I'm, I'm yeah, you, you, astounded. You risk your life. Yeah, when you risk yeah. your own life to save the lives of thousands of innocent human beings who you don't even know yeah. or didn't know yeah. before you started your heroic That's right. yeah. it's it's, it's mm -hmm. extraordinarily uh it's heroic, it's it's courageous, and it's mm -hmm. it's very it's it shows human beings at their best. We're not yes. you know the human potential. We're not. We're not just there's no, the human, human beings are not just Nazis or communists or you know vicious murderers. There's also there's also real heroes, and it's inspiring. And you know, like you, you know, go back to a point you made before, Robert. So you know, you and I are both inveterate hero worshippers, and I I never heard about. I can't even remember when I first heard about Wahlberg. But I don't know twenty. 25 mm -hmm. years ago, maybe I was reading something, you know, as a bookworm, and I came across a reference to this, to this guy, Raoul Wallenberg, you, you know, who's this? And, you know, and I'm reading, and I read about what he, what he did. It's just like, yeah. this, oh my God, oh my God, yeah. this, what, what a hero. Why isn't this guy more famous? You, you know, and this yeah. was after, I think this was after Schindler's List came out, which was 93, maybe. Um, yeah, he's a precursor, certainly the precursor. And even this documentary and uh, made for TV movie came out before Schindler's List. And I wish it was as popular, <laughs> you know, not, yeah. not taking anything away from Schindler, but. No, no, no. So it's, yeah. it's just, it's, I saw Schindler's List, didn't want to see it again. Because it's just no. It's, Spielberg yeah. does a great job. It's it's brutal. It shows what the yes. Holocaust was like. But Oscar yeah. Schindler, of course, rises from this morally from this profiteer on slave labor to mm -hmm. you know, a real hero who risks everything to save you know, the lives of any number of innocent human beings. Uh, so yeah. you know, Schindler's List was out and famous by the by the time, and I, and I was reading about Wallenberg a few years, you know, maybe five years later. And oh my God, this guy should be as famous as uh, you know as as Spielberg's yeah. film made Oscar Schindler. Mm -hmm. uh, so I didn't even realize I never I never saw the TV documentary. I'm glad they did. Was that Richard Chamberlain you said played Richard uh, Chamberlain? Played yeah, I put I put it in the in the show notes so you'd be able to, and it's free. You can find it free on YouTube, like three hours. That's great. Yeah. So so we, we, we'll do we'll do whatever we can to to justly commemorate Wallenberg's heroism and uh, yes. you know memorialize him as the you know as as the hero as the great hero he was. So uh, yes. any 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 last things we want to say about uh, about this? Uh, just thank hero? you, you know, thank you, thank you, Andy, for bringing this guy to my attention, and thank you, Raoul Wallenberg, for doing what you did because uh, these as as Reagan said, wherever he is, his humanity burns like a torch. And I think that's a fitting description for this type of hero. Yes. And, and, and I want to go back to what I said before, especially when you're standing up against communists or national socialists, which is you know, just the most blood drenched mass murder is. And you, you, it, 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 it's just horrific. We have to acknowledge 
the reality of what the communists did and what the Nazis did, it, it, you know, that human beings are sometimes monsters. But what heroes like Wallenberg show us is that not all human beings are monsters. Yes. There are, there are human right. beings who are, who are very, very good men or women and risk their lives to, to, do, yeah. to do good. So mm -hmm. I think we could salute. I say, say yes. thank you, uh, Raoul Wallenberg. We salute you. And we, uh, we anathematize national socialists and communists both. Yes. And uh, <laughs> we, we commemorate great heroes like Raoul Wallenberg. And we'll be back next week on yes. The Hero Show with the story of another uh, towering hero. So have have a absolutely. let's all let's all yeah absolutely right let's all strive mm -hmm. to lead more heroic lives be be inspired by by giants like Raoul Wallenberg and uh, we'll see you next week everybody on the Hero Show.